It is the greatest myth of modern times. An evil ring of power and an unlikely hero on a mission to destroy it. The Lord of the Rings is a world filled with warriors, wizards, and monsters, all created in the mind of one man. But there is more to it than imagination. The story has a series of intriguing connections to reality, from the trenches of World War I to the Bible. Now, discover the facts behind the fiction. This is the real story of the Lord of the Rings. A lone figure teeters on the edge of an abyss, gazing into the fiery pool of lava below. Here, the long, arduous journey of Frodo Baggins has come to an end. A mission to destroy an evil ring by casting it into the same fires from which it was forged. This is the quest at the heart of the Lord of the Rings. It is a classic story of good versus evil, unfolding in a world called Middle-earth. There's something about the Lord of the Rings that is able to speak to people, and I think that that has a lot to do with its connection to mythology. Behind the Lord of the Rings, there are a number of ancient and modern influences that combine to create the most ambitious mythological journey since the Odyssey. All of them are channeled through one man, author J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien famously wrote a letter saying that he wanted to create a mythology for my country. He was trying to produce a mythology that was truly English, that was centered around the North and West rather than around the Mediterranean Sea like the Greek and Roman had been. And since it didn't exist, he figured he would have to write it. To create his mythology, Tolkien drew from his own experiences in the modern world, as well as his favorite stories from the ancient world. He broke down many different mythologies and medieval traditions, then refashioned them to create his own mythos. Tolkien was really using a lot of the mythological elements uh, from Old English and from the Old Norse material. Beowulf, King Arthur, the Viking sagas, all are sources behind the Lord of the Rings. The ancient connections begin with the setting of the story. In Norse mythology, the world is made up of three levels. The highest is Asgard, dwelling place of the gods. The lowest is hell, underworld of the dead. Between the two lies the world inhabited by elves, dwarves, and men. It is called Midgard, which translates as Middle Earth. Middle Earth is the Midgard that we've encountered in Old Norse or Midanjerd in Anglo-Saxon, and it simply in those contexts means the earth in the middle between the sky and hell, surrounded by the ocean. In the Lord of the Rings, it is through Middle-earth that Frodo must travel to destroy the evil ring. This ring is the central focus of the story, and it too is inspired by earlier legends. The Lord of the Rings centers on 20 magical rings found in Middle-earth. Some of them offer healing. Others can extend life. But one is more powerful than all the others. It is called the One Ring. 
It has the ability to make the new wearer invisible when they put the ring on. A ring that can make someone invisible. It is a concept that plays a key role in The Lord of the Rings. But it didn't begin there. It can also be found in the most legendary tale of the Middle Ages. Another story of courage in a time of peril. King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. In the Arthurian legend, there are magical objects. And there is actually a case of a ring of invisibility that the maiden Lunet gives to the knight Owain. It's an intriguing parallel between two myths created more than a thousand years apart. But Frodo's ring does more than make its wearers invisible. It also corrupts them. The One Ring is a creation of an evil lord who imbued it with his own destructive power, Sauron. When Sauron forged the ring, he put part of himself in it. It's intrinsically evil. If, if you wear it and claim it, you cannot use it for any good cause. It is going to twist everything you do for evil. The One Ring actually has a malevolent spirit, part of Sauron's spirit, living inside of it. And so this malevolent spirit works on people to change them, to manipulate them, to do evil things. And the ring acts as an addiction. The longer you have it, the more you desire it. It's like a bottomless pit. This idea of an evil ring also has a mythical precedent. In an old Norse epic called the Valsunga Saga. Many of the Norse sagas are based on family histories. Uh, and we find this very engaging combination of historical material and mythological traditions. The Saga of the Volsungs is a, an Icelandic saga written sometime probably in the 1300s based on old Germanic tradition. It treats a set of Germanic cultural heroes uh, based loosely on historical figures that e existed in pre medieval times, the end of the uh, West Roman Empire. These heroes and the epic poems about them were very important in the Germanic warrior courts. When the Scandinavians settled Iceland, they took this tradition with them. There are some intriguing parallels between the Valsunga saga and the Lord of the Rings. In one scene of the saga, a king possesses a golden ring that gives him unimaginable wealth and riches. But the king's son wants it for himself, and the temptation drives him over the edge. He kills his father to claim the ring, then takes it and hides in a cavern. There, the evil ring transforms the prince into a hideous serpent. It's a harsh lesson in the danger of greed, one that echoes in the Lord of the Rings. This is in some ways quite similar to Gollum in the Lord of the Rings. Gollum was a hobbit originally. One day, he and his friend Deogal went fishing, and Deogal sees something glinting in the bottom of the river. He pulls it out, it's the ring, and it's so beautiful. But Gollum, whose name was Smegol at that time, wants the ring. He's so greedy about the gold that he murders his best friend. Gollum takes the ring and hides in a cavern, just like the prince in the Volsunga saga. He transforms into this hideous, long-lived, uh, but very pathetic creature. Gollum's entire life is spent dwelling on the fact that he possesses this ring and obsessing with it. It's completely taken over his mind. After possessing the ring for nearly 500 years, Gollum loses it. Sometime later, it ends up in the hands of an innocent hobbit named Frodo Baggins. Frodo, who is an interesting name because it means wise in Old Norse and Anglo-Saxon. And Frodo is the one who gets stuck with the ring. 
Frodo's journey begins in a land of rolling hills and green fields called the Shire. This is the home of his race, the Hobbits. Hobbits are a little people, probably four feet or shorter. They don't wear shoes because they have very thick soles on the bottom of their feet and lots of fur on the top of their feet. They're sort of homebodies. They don't ever really go in for adventures. The slow pace of life in the Shire mirrors author J.R.R. Tolkien's own childhood in the countryside of Western England. In some ways, Tolkien must have put himself into The Hobbit. Many of his ideals are embodied in The Hobbits. It's sort of embracing the rural ideal, embracing the simple pastoral life, common, good, old-fashioned virtues in the face of grandeur and pretension. A hobbit is the last creature one might expect to save the world from evil. But Frodo Baggins is different. Frodo is not a typical hobbit because he's learned. He's interested in elves and dwarves and outsiders, and he knows a little bit about the world. And he cares about the outside world enough to sacrifice everything he actually loves. If you go back to these original myths, you're looking at the heroes themselves, the warriors, if you will. Tolkien then takes this story, and he tells it from the point of view of a not likely hero, the reluctant warrior. And that, I think, is rather unique. Frodo inherits the One Ring from his uncle, Bilbo, who found it in Gollum's cave. When he discovers the ring's destructive power, he sets out to destroy it. But he soon finds himself being drawn in by its evil. In the beginning of the book, he already starts feeling the temptation of maybe putting the ring on and escaping, leaving his friends behind. He passes the test at that stage, but later on, the temptation becomes worse and worse. Frodo's quest to destroy evil is the heart of the Lord of the Rings. But the myth of Middle-earth doesn't begin there. This is only its final chapter. In 1977, more than 20 years after The Lord of the Rings was first published, its forgotten blueprint emerged, revealing for the first time how the most ambitious myth of the modern era really begins. It's a creation story with intriguing ties to the Christian Bible. The Lord of the Rings is a modern myth with direct connections to history's most legendary tales. J.R.R. Tolkien's mythological world is so detailed, he even created a word to describe it, mythopoeia. By this, he meant a whole mythic place that was a whole world very populated with a whole geography and a whole ability to map it. If you wanted an example in the modern period, you would look at uh, uh, the world created it with Star Wars, for example. Tolkien's Mythopoeia even had a creation story to explain how Middle-earth came into existence before the Lord of the Rings. But it wasn't published until after his death in a book called The Silmarillion. This was the blueprint for Middle-earth. All the ancient backstory to the Lord of the Rings, all the things that had happened thousands of years before, more than two feet thick, huge pile of papers, poems written in Elvish and English and histories, and the publishers were like, ah, we have no idea what to do with this. Tolkien drew from many sources as he set out to create his own mythical world. But there was one that influenced it above all others, the Bible. 
Tolkien was an extremely devout Roman Catholic for reasons of personal faith and also for family history. His mother converted to Catholicism, and when she did, her family sort of disowned her. She raised her two children Catholic, and then she died of diabetes when Tolkien was very young. He was adopted by a Roman Catholic priest who took care of him and his brother. So the whole work is informed by Catholic thought. And that shows through in his stories in some interesting ways, especially in creation stories and the role that the creator plays there. In Tolkien's story, there is one supreme god called Iluvatar. He creates angelic beings called the Anur, who sing songs so beautiful that the world springs forth from them. The world is created in a kind of giant symphony, or music of the Anyur, as it's called. Uh, and in singing their song before the throne of God, uh, they map out the whole history of the world that's to come, which God then uh, makes real. This is the beginning of Middle-earth, the future setting of the Lord of the Rings. By 1928, Tolkien had quietly sketched out the framework of his mythology. He didn't expect it to be seen beyond his close circle of friends. But then, a spark of inspiration hit that would transform him from a 36-year-old college professor into the modern master of myth. The famous stories, he was grading exams, a student had left a page blank, and Tolkien wrote on it, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. From this one sentence, a whole new world would open up. And he had no idea what it meant and started to develop the story from that. There may not be any very clear linguistic precedents for the word hobbit. Nevertheless, if you think about it, it sounds quite like the word habit or in the earlier uh, Latin habitus, a creature of habit, a creature that's set in its ways, living a very ordinary existence. Wordplay was nothing new for Tolkien. He began inventing his own phrases as a child. They became the foundation for the many languages spoken in The Lord of the Rings, especially the language of the elves. The elves are not to be confused with hobbits. They are a race of near-perfect immortal beings who represent a vision of what humans would be like had they not been tainted by the original sin of Adam and Eve. The elves speak in several distinct dialects and have the most fully developed of Middle-earth's languages. Some parts of the elvish language are based on a real one, Finnish. Tolkien learned it while studying the national myth of Finland called the Kalevala. The Kalevala is the epic of uh, the Finnish people. It includes dwarves and elves, and so in that way it has characters that uh, resonate and perhaps inspired some of uh, Tolkien's later writings. Languages of other creatures also, though, play an important role in the story. Even the language of the black speech spoken by Sauron gives you a sense of his ethos, of the nature of his being. So the languages of each of these different races tells you something about their nature. In the Lord of the Rings, another language belongs to the dwarves, a short, stout group of characters who live underground. Their alphabet is inspired by Norse inscriptions that can still be found in Scandinavia on ancient memorials called runestones. Runes were often used to mark objects of great significance. For example, swords that would be passed down as heirlooms, sometimes burial sites. Sometimes we have in runic writing short riddles that provide an extra problem for their interpreters. First you have to read the runic alphabet, then you have to figure out what the riddle means. Tolkien added a runic riddle to his first published novel, the epic precursor to The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. 
It centers on Bilbo Baggins, Frodo's uncle, a hobbit in search of stolen treasure. The clue to finding it is on an ancient map. It is a hidden runic text that can only be seen in moonlight. Tolkien actually wanted to make the runes be representative of a real language. It was an idea of secret writing, of magic writing, but also it was connected with his invented languages. The magic writing on the map leads Bilbo to the lair of Smaug, the most dreaded dragon in Middle-earth. This is the monster who holds the treasure. Smaug is the last of the great golden dragons, and he gathered up all the wealth from the Dwarfish Kingdom and piled it up into a huge mound. Dragons represent human greed, but really you know, uh, amplified uh, because this is this monstrous creature whose only interest is in, in gathering gold and keeping it. Bilbo bravely enters the dragon's lair and steals a golden cup from its hoard. In retaliation, Smaug angrily attacks a nearby village. This is the myth, but what inspired it? If the story of a dragon who guards a hoard of gold sounds familiar, there's a good reason. The plot of this incident is almost identical with the incident in Beowulf. Beowulf, one of the most famous myths in human history, and one that was a favorite of J.R.R. Tolkien. It is the story of a Scandinavian hero who becomes king of his homeland and faces the ultimate test, a fire-breathing dragon. The dragon is guarding a treasure from kings of a previous age. A slave discovers a secret passageway down into the dragon's lair, finds this fabulous treasure, sees the sleeping dragon, and creeps in and steals a gold cup. It's a tale with obvious similarities to the story in The Hobbit. Both are allegories about the danger of greed. In each case, a desire for treasure sets off a chain reaction of horrific consequences. Tolkien has taken that from Beowulf and made it into one of the crucial centerpieces of his entire story. Beowulf is one of many written sources that had a major impact on the Lord of the Rings. But there was a real life experience that shaped the story more than anything pulled from the pages of a book. A terrifying trauma laden with ghosts, blood, and death. The battle scarred trenches of World War I. France, 1916. A barrage of enemy fire rattles an Allied trench. A group of British soldiers scramble for safety, crawling like worms, inch by inch. Among them is 24-year-old Second Lieutenant J.R.R. Tolkien, future author of The Lord of the Rings. His experiences in war will have a profound influence on the mythical battle for Middle-earth. When we read Lord of the Rings and we read about the battles and we read about the bloodiness and, and we read about the destruction of nature, it is a statement about war. World War I was a scene of death on a scale that defies belief. The history books call it the Great War. 
a time when men slaughtered each other over mere yards of mud. Tolkien and the people of his generation that experienced World War I experienced a brutality in warfare that was unique. Not to say that warfare itself isn't bloody or violent, just the trench warfare in northern France was particularly gruesome. It was waiting around to see if you were going to be hit by an artillery shell. It was having your feet in so much uh, trench water that you developed a condition called trench foot, in which the flesh just slid off your bones. It was being attacked by mustard gas. And all this Tolkien would have seen. Lieutenant Tolkien sees action in the Battle of the Somme, a brutal stalemate that results in carnage on a scale never seen in human history. The Battle of the Somme raged for four months, each side losing one and a half million men. Nobody gained or lost an inch at the end of that battle. It was just a tragic waste of lives. After serving for approximately a year or so, Tolkien developed trench fever in the form of dysentery or typhus and was hospitalized and taken home, and it took him a very long time to recover, and he actually never returned to the war. He was damaged, wounded internally by the war and traumatized. The trauma that he had suffered had to have influenced the way he wrote about the trauma that Frodo experiences in his quest to destroy the ring. Much of Tolkien made its way into the hobbits without them being a thinly disguised Tolkien. In The Lord of the Rings, the hobbit Frodo travels through a bog called the Dead Marshes, where a great battle had taken place thousands of years earlier. There, ghosts are still lurking beneath the waterline. They lie in all the pools, pale faces, deep, deep under the dark water. I saw them, grim faces and evil and noble faces, and sad, but all foul, all rotting, all dead. In the dead marshes where you have this kind of rotting landscape with bodies of an older war, you definitely get these memories of the summer of the trenches, of these rotting bodies of soldiers. This is not anymore the idea of a heroic war. This is the death and devastation what is left, really, is just dead men. The horrors of war were first exposed in the precursor to the Lord of the Rings. The Hobbit. The story culminates in a battle of five different armies, all vying for the dragon's treasure. The main character, Bilbo Baggins, sees many of his companions killed on the battlefield and comes to understand the futility of war. Like Bilbo, Tolkien himself watched his companions die in battle. In France, he fought alongside three of his oldest and closest friends. But by November of 1916, two of them were dead. It seems obvious when one reads the story where you have comrades in arms facing a, a seemingly insurmountable foe and the fear that they feel and the sounds of the battle approaching. They know they're going to be tested and probably die that night and so on. And yet the way they find a way to express both humor and courage and to keep each other's spirits up in a time like that seems to be drawn directly from his battle experience. The misery and terror of World War I are reflected not only in the suffering of Middle-earth's heroes, but in the ruthlessness of its villains. Perhaps nowhere is Tolkien's war experience more powerfully revealed than in the horrific evil of the orcs.
The Lord of the Rings is the work of a vivid imagination. Rooted in ancient myth and modern life. The first-hand war experience of its author, J.R.R. Tolkien, framed its central conflict between good and evil forces. The final battlefield in that conflict is an infernal hell. Mordor. At the heart of Mordor lies Mount Doom, the volcano where the One Ring was forged. This is where the hobbit Frodo must come to destroy the ring before its evil power overcomes him. It is a setting drawn from one of the world's most well-known ancient sources, the Bible. If we look at the Bible, hell has been described as this place of fire and brimstone and eternal torment. And when we see Mordor, we see this place of this black wasteland. It's got very close connections with Dante's description of hell, in that there's the burning plain in hell, the dry desert with the flakes of fire falling from the sky. Even Mordor's name has a sinister ring to it. This is no accident. Mordor actually sounds similar to Mordor in uh, Anglo-Saxon, means morth, or me means a murder. We also have the connection to the old Norse, morth, literally, same thing, meaning murder. In the story, those who enter Mordor are as good as dead. It is patrolled by a race of ruthless foot soldiers known as orcs. The orcs are very horrible. They are bent, they are crooked, they are ugly. We are told that they are actually elves gone wrong. The dark forces have taken and twisted into this horrible race. They are described as creatures fascinated with machines fascinated with making clever things, fascinated with profit, who try to get other people to work for them. Uh, this has been read a, as sort of a thinly disguised uh, capitalist or capitalism. The orcs as capitalists. Orcs are completely corrupted. Uh, they, are, they are ruined. They, they were good creatures originally, but their wills are set entirely on evil. Mordor's evil race like so many components of the Lord of the Rings, may derive from an ancient myth. In line 512 of Beowulf, there's a description of all the evil creatures that have been descended from Cain after Cain killed his brother Abel. And those are Eotonas and Ulfa and Orkneas, and that is Etins and Elves and Orkneas. The Orkneas are demon-like beings in Beowulf. They have a spirit-like quality, but they're considered like an evil spirit being. Historical sources inspired not only Middle-earth's most despised fiends, but also one of its principal heroes, the wizard Gandalf. In The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf guides Frodo in his quest to destroy the One Ring. Gandalf has become an archetype for wizards after the writing of Lord of the Rings. Prior to that, magic was considered bad, anti-Christian, was a little bit evil. Gandalf, I think, is a solidly good figure. He really tries to do what's best for all the creatures of Middle-earth. Clues about Gandalf's origins can be found in Norse mythology. In the Old Norse, Gandalf means magical elf or magic-using elf. Uh, of course, Gandalf is not an elf, but he is certainly a magical figure of great power. But Gandalf draws more than his name from Norse myth. His appearance is modeled after its most powerful deity, Odin. To the ancient Scandinavians, Odin represented many things. He was a god of wisdom, war, battle, and death. But it is his role as the Wanderer that echoes most clearly in Gandalf. 
but it's clear that Odin inspired Gandalf. One of his aspects is the god of masks and many identities. And so he has many names, hundreds of names and disguises. And when he travels on Earth, he often travels as the Grey Wanderer. He's, he wears a gray robe, he has a wide-brimmed hat, he has a long beard, and all of these things fit very well with Gandalf. Like Odin, Gandalf roams Middle-earth for years, quietly working to destroy its evil forces. But the wizard may also be influenced by another, more prominent ancient figure. Gandalf has also been compared by some people to Jesus. He sacrifices himself, is dead, and comes back clothed in white. As Gandalf battles to save Frodo, he metaphorically dies and is resurrected as Gandalf the White. And this is one of the instances where we can see uh, Tolkien's uh, Catholic roots. A pagan god of many disguises and a Christian savior who was resurrected. Two powerful figures from the ancient world, both seen in one main character. This is what is so unique about Tolkien. He is very good at bringing together Christian and pagan motif. The religious influences behind The Lord of the Rings are fully revealed in the climax of the epic. As the story concludes, it is not Gandalf, but Frodo, who is in a position to save the world. The myth's defining moment will draw from a pivotal chapter in the life of Christ as Frodo faces the last temptation of the ring. Mordor, a fiery hell, home to the orcs and the evil Lord Sauron. This is where the hobbit Frodo finds himself at the end of a painful journey across Middle-earth. His quest to reach Mount Doom is over, but his real test is about to begin. To destroy the One Ring, Frodo must scale the mountain and drop it into the volcanic fires from which it was forged. But the ring won't go quietly. It's no accident that the symbol is a circle. It sucks in everything good about you and about your personality, just like any other kind of addiction, until all you can think about is the ring. As Frodo climbs Mount Doom, the ring draws him in, challenging him to abandon his mission and give in to its power. It is the ultimate battle with temptation, an internal struggle between darkness and light, inspired by author J.R.R. Tolkien's Christian worldview. The whole work is informed by Catholic thoughts. The very end, Tolkien said, was illustrating the last two petitions of the Lord's Prayer. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Frodo's final moments with the ring parallel one of the most famous passages in the New Testament. Satan comes to Earth to tempt Christ in the desert while Christ is fasting for 40 days. He tempts him with power. He tempts him with food. He tempts him with dominion over Earth. In the Bible, Jesus resists Satan's offer. But Frodo's will proves weaker. Frodo has made it to the very crack of doom, the edge of the chasm in the volcano where the ring was forged. And he has the ring on its chain, but he can't destroy it. It's become too much of his personality. And he says, I do not choose to do what I came here to do. The ring is mine, and he puts it on. The ring instantly makes Frodo invisible, but he is not alone. Gollum, 
The evil creature who once held the ring for hundreds of years has followed Frodo all the way to Mount Doom. He desperately wants the ring back, and now he sees his chance. Gollum bites his finger off. Gollum grabs the ring. He, in turn, falls into the fiery flames of the volcano. This destroys the ring. It obviously destroys Gollum. But then, in a sense, it liberates Frodo. As evil as Gollum is, it's Gollum who saves Middle-earth by doing something evil. If Gollum hadn't done that, the world wouldn't have been saved. So it's a nice little twist about how this all works together. A flawed hero who doesn't save the day. It's an ending that strays from Tolkien's Christian roots and mythological tradition. Usually a tragic hero, no matter what happens to him, at least he can feel good because he's done the right thing. Frodo could not. Despite Frodo's failure, the final outcome echoes the Christian belief that good will triumph over evil. But that triumph comes at a cost. After the ring is destroyed, Frodo and the hobbits return to the Shire. They are horrified by what awaits them there. They find the Shire in ruins. It's become an industrial nightmare. There are big steel machines everywhere. The people are oppressed, and it's a very dirty, polluted place. It is a vision of technology run amok. This was one of Tolkien's worst fears. In England, he saw the same transformation happening to the countryside he called home. Tolkien was deeply concerned from his early childhood about the process of industrialization, um, in large part because he saw it as a reflection of human corruption. That is, the urge to industrialize is, in his mind, inextricably connected with this impulse to dominate. And to Tolkien, it's the same will to dominate, whether you're dominating people or whether you're dominating trees and plants. When Frodo returns home from his quest to destroy the ring, he is restless. He has terrible dreams, and he can't readjust to life in the Shire. Frodo, like the author who created him, is a soul forever changed by traumatic memories. Frodo is wounded. He is devastated by his experience, and he can never live a normal life again. He bears the physical wound, but he also bears the spiritual wound in his soul. And this has to be a metaphor for what Tolkien is going through himself with his suffering from the First World War. I think what's really curious about the character Frodo and the author Tolkien is that after the end of the, the drama, so to speak, after the end of World War I, after the end of the War of the Ring, the kind of joy that we might imagine was missing. So we see this lingering malaise in Frodo, you might say, uh, as a result of being the ring bearer. And we might say that with Tolkien, he also had this lingering post-traumatic stress from seeing countless people butchered in the muddy fields of northern France. At the end of The Lord of the Rings, Frodo remains deeply wounded by his battle with evil. He leaves the Shire once and for all to seek a new beginning in Middle-earth's holy lands. And so ends the most ambitious mythology of the modern age. This is really what started, you might say, the whole genre of fantasy literature as we now know it. The idea of creating a world that really stands as a world of its own, that has its own history, is really fairly new and quite original. It's remarkable how popular The Lord of the Rings is 
so dense in so many ways and so complicated, but it has always had this really vibrant life among the common readers. And that's the thing that is so remarkable about it.